I'm Tom Stanier, the great nephew of Sir William, the celebrated designer of steam locomotives. I met him a couple of times, and so did various other members of the Stanier family. I tracked them down and interviewed them because I thought that their impressions of Sir William might be of interest to my own children in the future, and also to the steam buffs up and down the country. Sir William is principally known for the engines he designed for the LMS in the 30s. The Stania Pacific. The record-breaking Coronation. And of course, the Stania Black Fives. But to concentrate on the LMS exclusively is to miss half the story. For the first 30 years of his career were spent at Swindon with the GWR, and that is where we must begin. Will was the son of W.H. Stanier, another railway man, who was a substantial figure in his own right. W.H. Stanier started off as a humble office boy in Wolverhampton, but worked his way up and was eventually promoted to stores manager to the GWR. As you can tell from his house, he'd come a long way from his early days as an office boy. The workforce at Swindon in those days was huge, numbering well over 10,000, and that was just one part of the GWR. Will's father also took part in local politics, becoming mayor of Swindon in the 1890s. A street is named after him, though not, it has to be admitted, a very grand one. At the GWR, he proved himself both efficient and imaginative. He was a completely self-taught scientist, but he persuaded the management to let him build himself a laboratory in his home basement where he could test samples of incoming materials, a one-man research department. W. H. Stanier remained with the GWR all his life. Young Will, the future Sir William, followed in his footsteps. That's him standing beside his father. Will joined the GWR in 1891, aged 15, and he was in time to see the transition from broad gauge trains to standard gauge completed. Indeed, he watched the last of the broad gauge trains pass through Swindon in 1892. The GWR, God's wonderful railway, was a trailblazer, and Swindon was an excellent place to learn your trade. The boiler room was incredibly noisy and nearly all the men who worked there were deaf by the age of 30. No health and safety and no earmuffs in those days. But it must have been of great interest to Will as boiler design was to be one of the secrets of his later success. Will soon showed he had the same qualities of efficiency and inventiveness as his father had, and he learnt much from working closely with George Churchwood, the chief mechanical engineer. Indeed, he was to take with him some of Churchwood's design ideas when he moved to the LMS. At the same time, young Will was having success in his social life. My mother Ruth kept a diary, and this is an extract about Will's engagement. January the 24th, 1905. At dinner we heard that Mr. W. A. Stanier was engaged to Nellie Morse. No one who had seen it could ever forget Mr. W. A. Stanier's bubbling over delight and excitement on that evening. He wore a perpetual broad grin the whole time and occasionally broke out into a laugh about nothing new except that, as he repeated over and over again, I am the happiest man alive. Will brought Nell to dinner with us another evening soon after that, and he continued to beam and guffaw in his ecstasy. Well, of course, he spent many, many years uh, on the Great Western at Swindon. Uh, the family home was in Swindon. Uh, he married a girl from, from Swindon. Um, and uh, 
Uh, it wasn't until he was uh, around in his 50s uh, that he uh, moved uh, onto uh, the London Midland and Scottish Railway um, to become their chief mechanical engineer. And um, uh, of course, living in an area for all that time and originating from the area, uh, he got a bit of a Wiltshire, Wiltshire twang, uh, which um, he he kept with him all his life, uh, and and he never never forgot his ties with the Great Western. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, on several occasions uh, he would delight in telling people that he'd got GWR uh, embroidered on his pants. But however fond Will was of the GWR, change was in the offing. It was the amalgamation of the British Railways into four separate groups that caused the trouble. And uh, the Great Western was the lucky railway because they um, uh, simply absorbed a lot of minor Welsh railways and uh, there was no argument between one side or the other. But in the three other cases, uh, the Northwest, the LMS, uh, the North Eastern and uh, the Southern Railways, it was a case of amalgamating two or three major railways. Uh, and there were inevitably rifts and um, trouble between the different railways, each uh, uh, deciding who was going to be cock of the roost, with the result that the Great Western locomotives were streaking ahead with a steady, gradual improvement in design all the time, whereas these chaps were arguing with each other and uh, never evolved a satisfactory uh, locomotive stock. Will, by that time, was number two on the Great Western and uh, uh, he would have only had a year to go if he succeeded Collett. And uh, consequently, um, he, had, he was well known through the locomotive world uh, op in these other railways that I'm talking about, because he belonged to the locomotive societies and he was always uh, taking a part in it. And he was respected right throughout as, as a thoroughgoing railway locomotive engineer. It was inevitable that the LMS would make an approach and Tom still has a letter that describes how the offer was made. The letter was from Will to Tom's father, Charlie Stanier. Then came a letter, not a phone message, inviting Will to the Bishop's Club, the Athenaeum. Lemon met him at the portal and took Will in and introduced him to Sir Harold Hartley. Hartley uh, flung a bomb that made Bear Robert gasp by saying to Will, perhaps you have been wondering what we are driving at. And Will said he thought, what will be next? And then they offered him the CME, that's the Chief Mechanical Engineer. Will went home and told Nell, almost hysterics, and made her swear not a word to Joan and Bill. Then Will went to Paddington, saw Milne, uh, and found Collett will stay to 65, and Will, being then 60, uh, could never succeed him. So Will accepted. This is strict confidence. With love and to you all, Charlie. The challenge facing Will was huge. The GWR had run like clockwork, and the LMS was a bit of a shambles. Somehow, Will had to standardise a conglomeration of different workshops and railways who all thought they knew best, but who didn't. And he had to evolve a, uh, an efficient modern stock of, rail, of, of locomotives uh, for those railways. And where he was so good was that he was a great human relations man. He got them all working together. Uh, he wasn't one side or the other, he'd come from somebody quite separate, so he was persona grata. And uh, uh, he cr created a human organisation which was extraordinarily successful. Will settled down at the drawing board to create a fleet of locomotives that would wrest the initiative back to the LMS. 
His office and drawing board have been recreated at the Butterley Railway Museum, a place of pilgrimage for railway buffs. This figure was made by James Figures in London and we had him dressed in the Savile Row suit of the very highest quality, which was difficult to get hold of, silk tie, shirt and loose collar and uh, on the wall we have an LMS clock 14387 and drawing instruments actually on the table and a, nine, a genuine 1938 telephone. He always wore the best suits I'm given to understand. <laughs> yeah. No, we didn't make anything up. <laughs> One thing that Will incorporated in his designs was the best of the GWR technology. In, in fact, he spoke to his old boss on the Great Western um, and uh, uh, asked permission for a set of drawings of their biggest locomotive at the time, which was the King, which I gather was granted. And uh, so uh, a set of drawings were sent, uh, which he was able to, to obviously use many features uh, of the design in, in his even bigger locomotive that he had to design uh, from square one. And the first fruits of his leadership were the new Princess Royal locomotives. Things were moving in the right direction. It was remarkably generous of the GWR to say, yes, have them. It was, but uh, uh, don't forget in those days, Unlike today, perhaps, uh, engineers uh, of competing railway companies actually used to talk to each other. They used to meet together in the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, and uh, there was actually an Institution of Locomotive Engineers as well at that time. And they, they were all used to meet and, and talk, and uh, well, the modern term is network, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He, he and uh, Nigel Gresley knew each other well, and uh, I understand they uh, had tea together uh, quite regularly, um, and uh, sort of supported each other and uh, commented on each other's uh, practices and designs. And he knew uh, engineers from uh, other railways within yeah. the UK quite, uh, quite closely as well. So they were all in it together and comparing notes. But then came another challenge, the so-called Race to the North. Both the LNER and the LMS ran trains to Scotland. The LNER route went up the east coast. Here the route was largely flat and straight and was ideal for high-speed trains. The LMS route, by contrast, was full of sharp curves and hills and went through complicated junctions where speed would necessarily have to be reduced. The LNER established an early lead. Under Sir Nigel Gresley, they came up with a train which was not only powerful, but looked superb. The Silver Jubilee, with its glamorous silver streamlining. Silver Jubilee, drawn by the streamlined silver link, left King's Cross. She is to run regularly between London and Newcastle. Speed, comfort, and a wild modern beauty. The Silver Jubilee reached a record steam speed of 112 miles an hour. They had thrown down the gauntlet. Will was asked by his bosses to match the LNER. First of all, he created a massively powerful engine with an enormous boiler. The engine ran like a dream. But speed was not enough. Will was told that he had to streamline it to match the LNER. The result was the coronation. Up on the footplate, Will looked delighted. But privately, he was not so happy, for he thought the streamlining was just a PR stunt. He had spent some time on the Great Western in maintenance and clearly had uh, got a feel for what was, what was required uh, and uh, was not terribly happy with this remit that said, and they shall be streamlined. I don't think he was very keen on it. He thought it, it added to the weight of the engine a lot and 
it, and it, it didn't increase the speed significantly. And he just thought it was a bit fancy. The trouble is that it makes everything inaccessible. Uh, it weighs an extra two tons. On, 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 it was as much as that, the extra weight on, on, a, on a locomotive. Well, two tons on top of a hundred tons, it doesn't sound a lot, but it's, 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 it's unnecessary. He has said several times in papers, uh, and they did tests, uh, aerodynamic tests, and, and it emerged that uh, streamlining is only of any benefit at speeds above 70 miles an hour. And in those days, you didn't do much running above 70 miles an hour, so it was all a bit sort of a publicity thing. But whatever the pros and cons of streamlining, the Coronation was a superb machine, as was proved on its inaugural press run. 100 journalists and railway officials took part in a test run from Euston to Crewe and back that provided such an orgy of speed as has never before been indulged in over LMS metals. There was a downhill straight stretch of a few miles just outside Crewe which would give the train a chance to show off its paces and perhaps to break the world speed record. From 85 miles an hour, the speed rose quickly to 100. Faster yet and faster, eating up the miles. 102, 105, 108, and she still accelerates. Crew station and a 25 mile an hour speed limit was fast approaching, but the record was still not in the bag. The rhythm of the exhaust grows stronger, faster. 112.5 miles an hour for two miles, smoothly surging over the metals. A supreme effort, and Coronation has done it. 114 miles an hour, the highest speed yet attained in the Empire. With only two miles left to run, they slammed on the brakes and flames streamed from the tortured brake blocks. They were still going too fast, and the normally imperturbable Will was heard to say, Now we're for it! As the train shot into the station yard, it was still doing almost 60 miles an hour. As it hit the sharply curved track leading into the platform, the train lurched wildly. It was touch and go, but somehow they stayed on the rails and came safely to a halt. It was a new world record. The LMS had made its point, but it also showed the dangers of record-breaking attempts, and the two companies agreed to declare a truce. Did he ever talk to you about that and the race to the north? Not really, no. Um, I would think that uh, his view was that uh, it probably mattered little to him what sort of comp competition was going on at the time. He had a remit that he had to produce to meet that remit. You might think this was Will's finest hour, but in fact, what he was proudest of were the so-called Black Stanniers. In terms of the, his locomotives, without doubt, the, the one that uh, he has regularly mentioned uh, as uh, his, his favourite and, and, and the greatest success is the Black Five. They could, they could literally uh, go anywhere and do anything and uh, uh, whatever job they were given to do, they, they would always get there. Very, very rarely did you uh, hear of a, a Black Five failing on the job. Hundreds and hundreds were produced, and, and they literally went all over the system. Uh, they, could, they could literally uh, go anywhere and do anything. They were to prove their worth a thousand times over and never went wrong. They were an engineer's engine. How did they come to be known as Black Staniers? Of course they were always painted black. But who first came up with the name Black Staniers? I'm not sure to be honest. Uh, I, can, I can imagine my grandfather actually coming out with it. Uh, at the uh, sort of launch ceremony that they had for new loco classes. He could well have said to uh, people around him, uh, oh, that's a black stanier.
Will retired in 1944 from the LMS. His brilliant career was crowned by being elected a Fellow of the Royal Society, the first locomotive engineer to enjoy such an honour since Robert Stevenson. He was also delighted to have an engine named after him, a splendid representative of the Prince's coronation class. I asked some of my relatives what they felt was the secret of his success. Um, well, it's the old hackneyed saying of uh, uh, genius is a, the capacity of taking infinite pains, that he was a workman. Met him, had lunch at his, where he lived, and he gave me a book, and the thing I always remember about this book, which I still have, was that it was concerned with the economics of engineering. And the thing he impressed upon me at the time, which I've always remembered, was that engineers uh, had a role, a, a duty almost, to bring economics into the equation when they were uh, designing their bridge or their building or their locomotive. Very sort of rela relaxed sort of person. Uh, but at the same time, obviously full of energy and, and lots of bounce. And, um, he, he used to walk very quickly. Uh, and in fact, I think his, his nickname that was coined on, on the LMS when he was uh, sort of going round crew works to inspect all the uh, manufacturing and building that was going on, mm. um, he used to go so fast that people had great difficulty kept keeping up with him and they nick nicknamed him the Black Arrow. <laughs> Reliability in, in the vehicles, rather than as any fancy performance, was, was the important thing as far as he was concerned. Will also had the happy knack of finding simple solutions to practical problems. The ordinary person thinks that a rail track is dead smooth and you don't have potholes. Uh, because the rails themselves are dead smooth and, and dead straight. But they depend on the sleepers, and the sleepers are lying on the, on the track bed, and there may be holes in that. So, in effect, you get potholes on a railway just as much as you do on a road, uh, although they're not visible to the naked eye. But the result is that uh, the train going along, uh, going along on these smooth rails, but suddenly they come to a patch where the, the, the track underneath the rails is not solid. It's got soggy rain or drainage is bad or something of that sort. And there's a tremendous lurch. And there's always a great argument between the people looking after the track and the people looking after the rolling stock uh, uh, as to wh when, when there's a complaint about a lurch is it because the springing on the vehicle was wrong or is it because there was a bad spot in the track? <laughs> it was rather amusing the way he uh, did this. He took a complete train and fitted it up with different coloured whitewash in every lavatory compartment. And a chap standing by in the lavatory, you see, and then ran the train round the system. And when the, each chap, when he felt a lurch, he pulled the plug, you see, and a dab of white wash or blue wash or red wash went down on the track. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that was a fairly, fairly conclusive way of proving whether it was just a, a slight fault or a major one, because obviously if there was a, one of every colour uh, at the particular point in the, on the rail, there, there must be something wrong if one demand just happened to have a bad lurch on his particular coach, it didn't matter so much. But, but uh, it was a very effective way of proving that there were holes, virtually potholes, in the track. And I saw this train in Swindon when I was working there. And, uh, <laughs> of course, you could imagine all the under, undercount of the, the carriages were covered with blue or white or red or whatever it was. <laughs> Will live long enough to see steam being replaced by diesel and electric locomotives, and the old steam engines were being shunted off to the scrap heap. What would Will have felt about that? Oh, he had no, no, no nostalgia, not at all for steam, but uh, he's, he certainly realised that things couldn't stand still, and in terms of future development, uh, was very aware of things like diesel traction, uh, of electrification, 
and uh, much to my surprise, even even sort of in the early late 50s, early 60s, he was talking about uh, maybe nuclear energy uh, had a role to play. Railways were by no means his 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 total uh, occupation and interest. He he was a, an engineer in the broadest terms. He could also see the possibilities of the jet engine. He was uh, actually uh, quite friendly uh, with a very well-known engineer, uh, Frank Whittle. Um, and uh, uh, Frank Whittle uh, was having uh, virtually zero success uh, at trying to get his employers, Rolls-Royce, interested in the time at his, his, his gas turbine engine for aircraft. And, and Frank, uh, having got fed up with his employers, uh, set up his own company called Power Jets Limited. And uh, my grandfather was on the board of Power Jets, uh, so was very much involved with the development of gas turbine engines and their early introduction, uh, albeit reluctantly and from the point of view of Rolls-Royce, uh, into aircraft propulsion. But if Will was basically a forward-looking man, he would still have been delighted by the way steam is still alive and well on so many of the heritage railways. And he would have been delighted that his niece and great-nephew are actively involved in one such enterprise. Thank you. Thank you must have one of the most attractive stations in the country. And since he was 12, William Allett, yes, another William, has been actively involved on the Thlangothlan line as a ticket inspector, along with his mother. Dicks, please. In the course of these activities, William has become a fount of knowledge on all Thank matters you. locomotive. Uh, when we go through the tunnel, uh, both ways, we need to check that all the windows have been closed and the lights are switched on. Uh, and quite often, at being 50, 60 year old, a rolling stock, the lights don't really switch on quite as we planned. Uh, so we've got plenty of torches that it's that way. How long does the tunnel take to get through it's the tunnel? 689 yards, right. uh, so it takes uh, two or three minutes. Much as that. Um, yeah. And it's the longest single bore, non ventilated tunnel on a heritage railway in the United Kingdom. <laughs> You've answered that one before. Yes. <laughs> Tickets, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, so, these are Great Western Buttons, GWR, Great Western Railway. And I think you've got a. Do you have your stop? Your. What, yeah, what it's you? not actually a railway one. Railway ones, as you can imagine, are hugely sought after. This is an um, army services one um, that I think I found in yet another antiques market. We've been in quite a few over the years finding all these you've things. You've got a genuine whistle, I think. Um, this you? is a rather famous Acme Thunderer, um, and all of the big four got them. And this one's got the GWR stamp on the side. I'm pretty sure this is original. There are quite a few repro ones going around, but I, I think it is. If uh, the, the benevolent ghost of Sir William Stanier could appear to you tomorrow and you had a chance to talk to him, what would be the first question you'd ask him? Oh, gosh. I, I think I'd ask him uh, how did it all start and why is he interested and confirm that it is for him an interest, not just a job. Um, well, I'd probably congratulate him to start with. I think he'd be very amused to think we were still talking about him and that I think he'd be pleased to see that his locomotives were still pulling people and his coaches were still used. Sir William made many friends and many admirers in the course of his life and he also created some of the most magnificent locomotives ever to grace the railways of Britain. How very nice to have him in the family.